On October 10, 2011, hundreds of people in downtown Oakland occupied Frank Ogawa Plaza in front of City Hall. They renamed the plaza Oscar Grant Plaza in honor of a young African-American man who was shot and killed by Baud police in 2009. Although the action was partially inspired by Occupy Wall Street and austerity protests throughout the world, Occupy Oakland's particular character resulted from years of struggle and repression in the Bay Area. So I think that um, for Occupy Oakland, there are a couple of different trajectories or lineages. I mean, one is obviously the political sequence that begins with Tahrir Square and moves to Madrid and then finally Greece and all throughout Europe. Uh, and that was tremendously inspiring, I think, for a lot of people. And then also through the um, Oscar Grant uh, marches and riots in response to his murder. The New Year's Eve killing in 2009 of um, Oscar Grant by white police officers in front of tons of cell phone cameras sparked off um, some of the biggest rioting that California has seen since the Rodney King riots. What it did is that it, it brought to the light the in actual injustice by the, the law enforcement agencies. And then there was, you know, this this uh, wave of university occupations in 2009 that uh, in many ways was an inspiration for this and put the idea of, of occupying and taking space on the map for uh, people in the U.S. Um, and a lot of the people who uh, have been involved in Occupy Oakland since the beginning, participated in those. Another thing that has led the groundwork, I think, a lot politically um, in terms of consciousness that has made Occupy Oakland so militant is the entrenched historical consciousness of the Black Panther Party. This is where the Black Panthers, this was their standing point right here in Oakland, California. The brutality in Oakland has been going on for a long time, even from the Black Panther days. OPD uh, last year had uh, almost 10 murders that happened by the police. There was some kind of ground rules and parameters that were set up um, that were like quite a bit more radical than any of the other occupies. You know, no cops are allowed within the perimeter of the camp. I mean, that was like no other occupy had or has done that yet. Police were trying to uh, arrest somebody over there for a warrant that was taken care of. Uh, and uh, people uh, here at the GA, as you can see, went and showed up over there and pretty much pushed the police away. We, uh, I mean, that just shows that when you, when you uh, get together and, and fight together and, uh, as a united force, that you can make something happen. So, number one, you know, the, the attitude, very clear attitude towards the cops. Number two, a very clear um, position in relation to politicians. like. We don't endorse politicians, we don't let polit politicians uh, come and speak to us uh, for their political purposes. One of the iconic moments um, at, at our general assemblies was when uh, we got a letter from the city, you know, inventing all these violations that we were, we were uh, committing, and somebody from the audience yells, somebody from the assembly yells, burn it! And within two minutes, this letter from the city is being burned, and from everybody, and everybody's cheering. Everybody's like delighted and like, yeah. So that kind of defines a little bit uh, something about Occupy Oakland and the politics and the spirit of it. Why we call it the Oakland Commune is because there really is a sense here that there's a commune in terms of um, you know mutual aid and solidarity com and and compulsively trying to figure out and self-organize together to get our material needs met. So while we don't make demands, we have identified in a collective sense material needs that are not being met. The Oakland Commune quickly became a safe place where people could help themselves and each other to food, shelter, medical care, and many other basic necessities. We, we, we really needed a place, a public space to hang out and to be able to be with each other but also open to, to, to new people. And, and here it was, like, you know, more amazing than any of us could have imagined. And then there's all these other immediate needs that were being fulfilled, like f food, shelter, medical attention. And what was amazing about it is like, needs were getting filled, but it's not just that. And in some sense, that's not even the most important thing. It's that people were themselves being proactive about meeting their needs and the needs of people around them. The fact that we were able to feed over the, uh, a thousand people daily, uh, not just daily, like three uh, square meals a day, but this was a 24-hour process that we were doing. This is somewhere that you could come and get something to eat. But all the homeless people that were there pretty much came here because they felt this is a, a place where they could have safety, uh, you know what I'm saying? Because there was a big community here, there was a lot of safety here, and they took it out, out, off the streets and they came here, now they didn't have to worry about the rain or the cold uh, and, and shelter. I am homeless and I've 
slept here in my tent, you know, with my son, you know. So we've been here. We had a, a warm place to sleep, you know, it was a tent. You know, out of the cold, out of the rain. Here they were staying free, they were being fed for free, and if they had a, a, a little illness, like let's say a cold, or, or, or a scratch, or, or, or even a sprained ankle, we also had a medical tent here, uh, that, that people got free health care. It builds up their self-worth, their awareness, you know what I'm saying? It builds, you know what I'm saying, relationships in the community. Who said that we needed government um, uh, abilities and uh, programs for us to be able to progress into our daily lives when we do that ourselves? It's so many people's lives that's been changed right here. This is a good environment. I never would have thought my whole 24 years of living in Oakland, I never would have thought I'd see something like this. In the early morning hours of October 25th, 2011, Oscar Grand Plaza was evicted by the police. When there was this pre-dawn raid on the camp, and mind you, 300 people had set up barricades all around this plaza, this because we said that we're not gonna just go quietly and give up our space. The police um, tear gassed us and shot us with rubber bullets to keep us out of the plaza. And despite not having had any previous experience with tear gas and rubber bullets, and despite the, despite the extreme violence that led to the near death of um, Iraq veteran Scott Olson, Oakland residents just kept on coming into the streets more and more and more in attempts to retake the plaza. The next night, a um, thousand people came to the plaza, tore down the fence that the city had erected, had a general assembly. Uh, uh, the general assembly is debating a proposal and is about to vote on a proposal about whether or not there's going to be a general strike next week. Mike check! Mike check! We have the vote count! We have the vote count! There are 1,484 77 abstentions and there are 36 disagrees. Occupy Oakland came to overwhelming consensus to call for and organize a general strike. Early morning on November 2, 2011, many targeted banks through decentralized direct actions across the Bay Area as part of the general strike. In the afternoon, an anti-capitalist march targeted businesses that had forbidden their employees from participating in the strike. They culminated with the first port shutdown called for by those involved in the Occupy movement. As part of the Oakland general strike, we will march on the port of Oakland and shut it down. We will converge at 5 p.m. at 14th and Broadway and march to the port to shut it down before the 7 p.m. night shift. We are doing this in order to blockade the flow of capital on the day of the general strike as well as to show our commitment to solidarity with the longshore workers in their struggle against EGT. Uh... Tens of thousands swarmed the port of Oakland, the fifth busiest shipping port in the country, and by early evening the port was effectively shut down. That night, protesters also took over the Traveler's Aid Building that provided services to the homeless but lost its lease due to cuts in government funding. Maybe we can protect, maybe we can protect others saving their stuff. Oscar Grand Plaza was evicted again on November 14th as part of a nationally coordinated raid targeting the Occupy movement. The, the movement's strong. You know, they, they, they never stopped uh, Occupy Oakland. It never happened. Uh, it, the most, the most time they took us away from here was during that first raid when they knocked us out and then we came back the next day and we took the plaza, re-established ourselves. Uh, and that's the persistence. And then when they knocked us down the second time, we went and took over 19th and Telegraph. Occupy Oakland responded by taking over a second empty lot and by calling for a West Coast port shutdown. When we were evicted the second time, um, from our camp, 
we decided to call for an even bigger action, which was the West Coast port shutdown. We said, you know, if you're going to coordinate an attack on us, we're going to turn around and coordinate an attack on you. And the West Coast port shutdown was a resounding success. We, we shut down the whole West Coast. You know, we shut down the, the, the ports. You know, that was called out. So we, we, we're constantly taking actions. It, it remains to be seen whether you know, whether the Occupy movement overall can kind of move out of uh, merely trying to kind of claim some kind of public voice or some kind of public space or, or community uh, into actually uh, taking the things that people need and, and providing for people. Here in Oakland, we're now making a push to kind of move indoors and claim a vacant building. I think that will, you know, really sort of move from from claiming public space to actually sort of challenging the rule of private property. On January 28th, protesters are planning a move-in day. They plan to occupy a vacant building and create a social center for the community. In the coming days, they are also planning a caravan to Longview, Washington, in solidarity with the longshoremen, who will attempt to prevent EGT from docking and loading their latest grain shipment. The Oakland Commune's days of action are far from over. They continue to draw strength from the community they have built and sustained as they reshape the political and social terrain of the East Bay.